That was a pretty interesting discussion we had just before this, especially talking about technology. They also had some um, maybe off the head comments on the SEC, and you know, I believe everybody's working hard on the regulation side of things. Uh, we've actually come to nearly the end of day two of Unitize 2020, and we are now talking about, I think, personally, a very, very important topic. In fact, personally, I would think the most important topic um, of the day, which is the one about tax consideration considerations. Um, it is a widely debated topic and a one which I personally feel is the cornerstone in shaping regulations for the foreseeable future, um, which is um, essentially the tax element that is uh, tied to the growth of digital assets. Uh, Lawrence Zletkin from Coinbase will lead this discussion and he will be joined by Rob of Deloitte as well as Jessica from Fidelity. Enjoy the session, everyone, and we'll be back very shortly after this for some closing remarks and announcements about day three onwards for Unitize. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining today. Um, we are going to talk about tax considerations associated with the world of proliferating digital assets. I am so fortunate to be joined today by two uh, friends and, and clients. Um, that is Jessica Reif Kaplan of Fidelity and Lawrence Lacken of Coinbase. Um, so really excited to have a, a good dialogue uh, about, about tax, which some find to be a bit of a mystery in this space. But I'll say um, we've seen just so much momentum gained across industry segments and really credentialized by, by organizations that now have tenured um, tax professionals leading the organizations focused on digital assets. Hopefully, we're going to bring some great insights today. Um, there is a Q&A live uh, chat feature enabled, so please give us those really hard questions and, uh, and we'll do our best to have a, have a good dialogue. Um, but let's start with some introductions. So my name is Rob Massey. I am a tax partner at Deloitte. And for the last seven and a half years, I have been focused on blockchain and digital assets. So we serve throughout the ecosystem, um, whether they are infrastructure companies like exchanges or custodians. We serve a lot of funds, those who inspire new tokens and protocols, as well as a lot of uh, tax controversy work out there, those navigating the rules. Um, so that's a little about me. Um, Jessica, would you like to give some background? Sure. So I am Jessica Reith Kaplan. As Rob said, I am VP and tax counsel at Fidelity. I've been here about nine years now. Uh, at the beginning, I primarily supported our traditional business units, as I'll call it, and I still do, um, mostly our mutual funds and our brokerage, things like that. Um, but now I also support any of our digital asset related endeavors. Fidelity has really been interested in crypto and, and digital assets for a while. It likes to think of itself as an early adopter. Uh, we could use Bitcoin way back to pay for our lunch in the cafeteria. You may have heard about our charitable gift fund, which started accepting donations of Bitcoin back in 2015 and actually has received quite a bit to date. Um, and then we also have our FDAS business, Fidelity Digital Assets, which provides integrated custody and execution services primarily to serve the institutional market um, where folks saw a gap there and, and wanted to build something to meet that. So I've really loved learning about digital assets along the way. It's been really interesting to see the similarities and the differences between the traditional markets. And I'm excited to be here today and talk with you guys. Thank you, Jessica. Great looking forward to those insights. I am right. so impressed that I can go to the Fidelity cafeteria and use Bitcoin. <laughs> I am going to take you up on that one. We can get out of our <laughs> houses and do something like that. Perfect. Uh, Lauren Slacken, uh, I am Chief Tax Officer for Coinbase. People may know that Coinbase is the largest exchange uh, in the United States for digital assets. We also operate globally and have um, a significant presence outside the United States. Uh, I joined Coinbase five, all of five months ago, and I, um, like Jessica, come from the more traditional world. Um, mine is even more old line. Um, I spent most of my career at the General Electric Company, which is about as diametrically on the other side of the equation of, of technology, but you know, was a is still a great technology company. Spent most of my career there. Uh, I joined Coinbase, as I said, five months ago. I think it's just a this is like the future. So this is the 21st century economy, finance. And this is the way things are going. Uh, it's just filled with lots of interesting issues, questions, and has so much enormous potential. So I love every minute that I'm here. Great, great background, and so fortunate to have you both. Um, I might just do a little bit of framing before we get into it, and and two two data points 
you know, a lot of surveys out there to uh, to take a pulse, you know, what's real versus what is the echo chamber that we all live in in digital assets. But um, Fidelity put out a really good survey not long ago that confirmed that almost 80% of investors surveyed find something very appealing about digital asset as an asset class. And I think given the, the, the base that Fidelity serves, I, I find that to be a, a good meaningful data point that says, yes, you know, we're evolving and this is something that people care about. Um, Deloitte also recently uh, put out a, our annual survey and, and the 2020 survey just came back. And, and one of the data points I took from that is that 89% of those surveyed believe that digital assets is going to be important to their industry in the next three years. And, and, and this really relates to all industries. We tried to, to get a large base in that survey, but, um, but pretty telling. We are living in um, just an evolution and, and what blockchain and digital assets brings is truly transformative to all industries, but particularly financial services. Um, more and more people are calling this an asset class, um, knowing that there are types of digital assets and tokens and, and, and um, you know, digital representations of something that are all very, very different that I think we as tax people are sensitive to, just because if we're gonna, if we're gonna create a, um, a point of view about what is the tax ramifications of a particular asset, then we want to know what it what it really is and what it means with the stodgy case law that we have to compare it to because there's nothing new on point. Um, we do have a little bit of IRS guidance, but but we don't have a ton and very little that's on point, which makes our jobs pretty interesting. We have super cool debates um, referencing case law, some of which goes back to World War II, uh, which doesn't seem as relevant, but that's what we have. And so the theme that, that I think we should try and portray as we go through our different segments of today is, um, you know, how we navigate these, these rules and, and all of us part of organizations that are trying to do the right thing based on what we have. And uh, so that hopefully represents the, the tour that we're gonna take. Um, so with that, Lawrence, maybe we can start off talking about informational reporting, which is a, um, you know, it seems very compliancy and very burdensome and a bit mysterious to many, but I know it's super important in terms of being compliant in our organization. So do you want to kind of frame, you know, where, where we are in the rules today as they relate to the U.S., then we can, you know, spin out to some non-U.S. compliance as well. But in, in the world of informational reporting, you know, how do you, how do you think about it in the state of play as it relates to, to Coinbase? So it's interesting that you talked about ambiguity and lack of clarity, because that also exists in this particular element of information reporting, which is just a very fancy word for com uh, basically ensuring that people report transactions to the IRS. So, and to the, in the US and then to non, we have an analog outside the United States as well. So information reporting is um, somewhat uncharted territory for crypto because it doesn't readily fit the definition of a financial asset, which is typically subject to these types of rules. Mm -hmm. um, so we're sort of na navigating through that paradigm, if you will. Um, so the perspective of the, the reason why this is really important, I think, is because it sort of frames who our participants are and how governments have responded to date um, towards those participants. There's a certain sense which continues within both the Treasury and the IRS here, and even outside the United States, that the participants in this world don't report taxes. They are evaders. Um, they're nefarious bad actors. I can use a whole host of James Bond type terms associated with them. Um, and information reporting is supposed to address that. So information reporting is essentially the 1099s that you get from a brokerage house like Fidelity every year. And from Fidelity is probably a 1099B, that's a broker dealer report. And it essentially provides transactional data that the IRS then receives that you match against your tax return. And the IRS um, envisioned these rules to keep people honest. Um, so these are robust rules that are designed to basically provide the impetus for you to report transactions to the IRS. Again, the perception is that in this industry, people don't readily report transactions to the IRS. Um, so there are lots of ways of thinking about it. From our standpoint at Coinbase, it really has two elements to it. Um, one is what do we tell our customers just in terms of trans transactional data? Um, we assume all of our, we operate from the standpoint that our client base is compliant, uh, reports transactions, and is honest. Uh, we operate from the standpoint of trust as well. That's our essentially the, the ethos of what Coinbase is about. Um, so we want to report transactions to our customers um, in, a, in a 
in, in, an, in an informative way um, so they can report transactions accordingly. So um, so we provide that data to our customers when and, and the the reason this is important is because the rules in this area, as I said, are unclear. The rules that apply to a fidelity for reporting broker-dealer transactions don't necessarily apply to crypto. So it's unclear whether we're subject to these rules at all. So we can spend a whole lot of time on that, but I will just tell you that that's, that's something the IRS and Treasury are actually really focusing on right now. So we're expecting regulations that will ultimately result in a broker-dealer type reporting regime. Um, I dare say a broker-dealer type reporting regime because it's, it's not entirely clear. You know, there are different aspects of information reporting that can apply. There's not just broker-dealer reporting. There are barter. Tra- I mean, there are a whole host of transactional data points that, that exist as well. The other side of it is onboarding, which is my version of tax KYC AML. Um, they're very much tied. They're very much linked together. If you're subject to information reporting, then you're required to get certain forms from your customer base. These are the W8s and W9s that U.S. people typically uh, have to provide when they open accounts. Um, and FinCEN, the Treasury Department, is very focused, as I said, on bad actors. So KYC, money laundering, that's know your customer money, anti-monitoring laws, rules, are extremely important to the financial services industry. Our version of that is the W8, W9. Um, so we also, again, these rules are unclear. If the if you're not required to provide information reporting, the analog to that is you're not required technically to then collect W8s and W9s. So our our, tr- our compliance operation may still get the KYC AML. So we know that our customers are legitimate, which we actively do. We have an entire enterprise, a compliance team that does that. But that's another aspect, particularly for an exchange of onboarding people um, into, into the system. There's also an international analog, which I, you know, that also applies. The OECD looks at that. There's there are just lots of rules that apply outside the United States as well. We have international exchanges, so we worry about how those rules are going to evolve um, anywhere we operate and anywhere our customers are located. Yeah, I think I'd add. <laughs> Jessica, go ahead. And add in. Yeah, I mean, I think I'd add to that. I think you know, Lawrence is highlighting really one of the most fundamental things here, which is that there's no clear guidance about what's required. And so this is really, it's confusing to the industry. I think in general, we would like to say that the industry wants to do the right thing here and wants to provide the right information. And I think if the government's so worried about bad actors, they really want good information as well. And so I think this is one of those places where guidance will be really appreciated by many. It won't just be a one-sided sort of thing. So it'll be really, really nice if and when that actually comes, as we've been expecting it for a while now. Um, and I think it would also just give a lot of certainty to people. What we see, you know, brief surveys of looking around is that people in the industry are taking different positions about what may or may not be required. And so it would be nice to have some consistency that helps the industry mature. It makes it look more formal. I mean, these would all be really good things as we're developing the digital assets industry. And so I think that would be really nice. I think the one other piece that we think about as we think about guidance is time to implementation, because that's the other side of this, is that we want guidance, we want clarity, but then we need some time to unpack that and put that into play. And particularly in an industry like this, where, you know, as, as has been mentioned, Fidelity, we have a brokerage business, we're very familiar with 1099. A lot of other folks in the industry are not spending a lot of time with that, might not have that history. And so really time is needed to put those rules into place. A number of years ago, we had the cost basis rules that were put into place for the traditional markets, and they needed a lot of lead time, even for people who dealt with this on a daily basis to do that correctly and to put those into play. And so hopefully some of that has been learned. And so whenever guidance comes out, there really is that time available for people to be able to put those rules into place. Mm-hmm. So I, I would like to say I agree entirely with Jessica. So um, their lead time is extremely important. Guidance is extremely important. Uh, as Jessica said, I think it would be you'd be hard pressed to find an exchange or reporting um, mechanism that now is available for someone to implement just essentially within a very short time frame. No one in the industry really is even geared up from a systems perspective, an IT perspective. So we need, and again, the framework is a very traditional framework of 1099B. So. Jessica touched on a really important t- um, point of all this, which is basis reporting. So essentially to, to report a transaction, you have to report your purchase price, basically your basis, what you, how, what you acquired it for, and then essentially what you sell it for. 
that's not that's information that we have on our exchange for customers that participate in our exchange, but people don't necessarily send assets to us um, by buying them on our exchange. So this was equally true in the broker dealer industry. So um, and um, they spent years developing rules and mechanisms for tracking bases that's shared among institutions so that there is a sharing of basis information so that taxpayers have this information readily available and institutions can report it on 1099B. But that takes a long time. I mean, it just doesn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we operate from the standpoint as we get, so every tax season, we get thousands of calls from our customers about reporting. So regardless of what Jessica just said or what we just talked about of government rules, um, are my view at least and what i'm tasked to do is provide tax information to my customers because if they're required to report transactional data and their gain or losses on a u.s tax return um, they want that data and the data they assume is coming from us so it's part of our customer experience if we don't effectively provide that irrespective of what the irs wants us to do then we haven't satisfied our job and our customer has a bad experience overall which is which is not a good thing. So again, we spend a, we are spending now a fair amount of time trying to reconfigure and redeploy our tax, what I call our tax homepage, so that people will have the transactional data to um, to fulfill their tax obligations. Wow, I mean, I, can you just feel the heavy compliance burden? <laughs> right? This is extraordinary, and in a world of ambiguity, um, this this is hard. A lot of resources spent, you know, trying to get it right. And and I appreciate the point, you know, having a runway to to correct if if there's a if there's a different um, you know compliance thought that that comes in. Um, and 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 I, we're very focused on the U.S. But is there a parallel phenomenon happening outside the U.S. when it comes to common reporting standards? Jessica, I know you spend a lot of time on this as well. Yeah, I think the three of us actually spend a lot of time figuring about it. So uh, Lawrence already referenced the OECD is spending a lot of time, has this in their crosshairs, if you will. They're looking at this closely and they're soliciting information from people in the industry to understand really what are people doing today? What's, you know, Lawrence referenced traditional KYC AML. What's happening there? What are people collecting? What do people know about their customers? And then how can that information be used to report to the authorities? And so the OECD is looking at it at a slightly higher level. They're looking at it similar to what already happens in traditional markets. At least that's what we understand. And that's what we would advocate really should be the great result, you know, not to make digital assets a little bit more complicated than traditional markets, perhaps. Um, but it's it's unclear really where that's going. I think, you know, the basis tracking question that Lawrence raised is one that's come up. There's questions about, do you uh, do year-end account information? What would that look like? How do you report it? And it raises a lot of additional questions, too, when you have requirements like that, right? I think we're all familiar with the fact that valuation of a digital asset is a different beast than it is of a traditional security that's traded on exchange. So if you're going to do year-end reporting, what's the valuation of that asset when you do the reporting? So this OECD uh, analysis is really raising a lot of additional issues, and it just shows sort of the complexity of the digital asset space and how much needs to be taken into account when you're providing regulations, when you're looking at this whole scale of what you want to do going forward. Yeah. Wild and, and evolving rapidly, right? More and more instances of people caring about this topic and new business coming online and new new, con, new consumers and, and institutions. Um, so the, the, in, the, the, yeah? the OECD, it's called work, and the OECD basically is an organization of developed economies and it has a tax a committee on fiscal affairs um, that Jessica referenced. It's called Working Group 10 that's focused on information reporting or what you refer to as a common reporting standard. There already are rules for how people deal with common reporting standard for standard financial transactions. What mostly exists outside the U.S., I would point out, is mostly focused on identification of taxpayers. It's not focused on transactional data. So the IRS and our U.S. Treasury, is um, they are probably the most ambitious about what they expect exchanges and brokerage houses to provide. Um, that doesn't exist for the most part outside the United States. For the Outside the United States, it's really mostly the KYC AML. It's like, mm -hmm. who, who are you? Are you a legitimate person? Where you come from? Are you essentially just essentially validating from a tax standpoint who you are so a tax authority can then go in and audit you? Almost all jurisdictions that we deal with 
have that perspective in mind um, in that they are much, they're, they are much more interested in a, a just audit and identification, name identification, tell us who your customers are and we'll do the rest because um, there's no tradition within their platforms for transactional reporting, um, which makes it a little bit easier to implement because it's not that it's easy, but it's, it's just, it's essentially more uploading and onboarding as opposed to transaction reporting, which is all the complexities that Jen, Jessica just referred to. Mm -hmm. So, so I wonder, let, let's maybe pivot to something a little more, um, a little different than, than the administrative burden of, of compliance. And, and let's talk about what's happening with lending. I mean, aren't we seeing, I know I see it, I know both of you see it in, you know, more and more um, investors, large scale investors, funds, institutions saying, you know, um, we're, we, we, we appreciate the, 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 the markets and, you know, is there a means for us to actually lend those assets, have, put them to work, if you will, and allowing liquidity in the market? And, and I think the answer is yes, based on the activity that we're seeing. Do you, do you guys want to comment, maybe start with Jessica, about what you're seeing in the lending space and then some of the interesting questions coming around uh, lending digital assets? Sure. So I think you really set the table there. I think what folks are hearing in the general sense in the industry is that people want to put their digital assets to work, right? If I put my cash in a bank account in normal times, maybe not now, I earn some sort of interest on it. If I buy a security and equity, I hopefully get dividends. And so people want more than just potentially appreciation on their digital assets. They want to put it to work. And so one of the business opportunities that has been raised is the idea of lending out your digital assets. From a tax perspective, I find this very, very interesting because there's actually a lot of uncertainty here about what really makes a good loan for tax. And you see that people are sort of taking different positions here or have different comfort levels with the level of risk. So I'll set the stage really briefly, some, some boring tax stuff for people. But what happens here is that in the 70s, there was a code provision added that allowed for securities lending. And some see this as a safe harbor. Some see this as just a clarification. But in either case, when that provision was added, it was drafted to only apply to interests in corporations. And obviously, digital assets are not corporations. And so when people are lending, they have to look to more general tax principles to reach a conclusion that it should be respected as a loan and not really as a sale. And so what we see in the marketplace is a lot of people getting comfortable taking that position or at least comfortable taking on that risk. But it's still a risk, right? And it's actually really interesting too, you know, as I mentioned, I, I work in the traditional markets as well. This is not unique to digital assets. People for years have been asking, is a loan of a master limited partnership, like an oil and gas partnership, is that going to be a good loan for tax purposes? Is a loan of a grant or trust, like the gold trust, would that be a good loan for tax purposes? So there's a lot of places here where the service could perhaps add some clarification. And in this case in particular, I think this is a growing industry. This is a growing place where people are looking to earn some return. But because of the risk, some people might be chilled from doing it. And I think some clarification here would probably be really interesting and really helpful for people because then really it's our customers. And we always, everybody on this call, and you know, I think most people in the industry wants to do the right things by their customers. And it's really the customer's risk at the end of the day. Will this be respected or will it not be? And so it'd be really nice to have that clarification for them so that they can be comfortable when they're lending their crypto, that it's going to be respected and that the return they're receiving is a return on a loan, is a borrow fee. Without that, I, I, I think it's going to be hard pressed for the industry to mature in the way that folks particularly would want it to mature because this uncertainty will always exist. Yeah. And, and fascinating, right? And, and going back to the point that all digital assets are not created equal, the rights associated with digital assets are also evolving, right? It, it used to be not too long ago that what we thought about were forks and airdrops, and now we've also got staking assets. And such that the rights of the holder of a digital asset, you know, could, could, um, could associate with economic benefits on a real-time basis if it's a staking asset. And then how does that come into play when you're talking about lending the thing and and how is that respected or not from a from a tax perspective again a lot of people in the industry want to enable these transactions because it does put them to work but these unanswered questions it makes it it makes it hard um lawrence perspective on this uh well everything you've said is music to my ears this is mostly our customers issue uh we have a very substantial custody business where we uh, essentially hold assets for our institutional and funds um there's a there are 
billions of dollars worth of assets right now with built-in gains, maybe some with built-in losses that are sitting on the sidelines that in this economy could be made uh, more useful through, through facilitating secure, what the analog to securities lending that Jessica just referred to. So you refer to the term ambiguity. This is another area that is rife with ambiguity. And, yeah. and this is another area where I, I'm going to whine about this, but I think the government does not has not lived up to its its role of providing adequate guidance to the industry of how we should handle these transactions. These are real transactions. Some, I mean, you end up in a world in which small players will still do this anyhow. It's still going to happen. The IRS is going to ultimately have to deal with this and on the audit side. So it uh, we. We've seen, I mean, it's no secret, some of us have asked for private rulings, have, have sort of asked for guidance in this area, and um, we don't have anything just yet. So um, right now, it's essentially the Wild West, if you will. So if you don't have ambiguity, you have lack of clarity, then you have people taking all sorts of different positions, which can whipsaw the government as well. So you have assets that have built in gains, you have assets that have built in losses. The people who have gains are going to take the position that there's just securities that they're lending, and therefore there's no gain or loss associated with the transaction. Other people are just going to say, well, if there's a built-in loss, I'm going to take advantage of my loss now because essentially there's no rule. The government thinks that there's a disposition event, so therefore I'll take the loss. The government gets whipsawed on both sides of the equation. And then some taxpayers don't want to take the risk, so they'll just sit by the sidelines. And again, in a world that needs liquidity, I mean, we're all about liquidity right now. Um, why don't we have clarity in terms of these transactions themselves? So it's a it's a major, major impediment to crypto lending right now, digital asset lending. Yeah, I, I personally, I'm a big fan of the ruling process for 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 um, this topic, because and for those of you who don't know, um, you know, when when a taxpayer receives a private letter ruling, um, at the completion of that process, it's redacted and then made public. And while it's not super strong authoritative guidance, it's something. It's a good example. And what we find are you know taxpayers in the space that are trying to do the right thing and they hire the right people both internally and externally and and you know here you have taxpayers doing the work with their advisors to put forward hey here's a set of facts that matters to us okay and we're going to do all the research that says this is why we think it's the right answer which then should make it easy for the irs to come in and say yes we like it we don't like it we like this about it what we don't like about it and it provides a way to 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 give guidance right again not hugely authoritative but it's something that's practical and real and meaningful enough for one taxpayer to get a ruling um that, that benefits the industry so I, personally i'm a fan i know that um that's not as easy as i just summarized it but it is something that that i know myself and others are really working toward and, and hopefully we can we can get there um, and that applies to a lot of the things we're having um, ambiguity on uh, another one that's coming up a lot is staking uh, again talk about putting your assets to work and we have some staking protocols which are which are brand new as staking protocols others are, are are thinking about you know actually changing the fundamentals about how the networks work and allow staking mechanism versus versus proof of work um, Lawrence, do you want to talk about some of the interesting things around staking and, and some of the tax considerations there? Well, again, this is another, I mean, the, probably the theme, if you get nothing out of what we're saying, the theme is ambiguity, right? So there's no real absolute clarity. Um, staking is sort of the future, I think, of digital assets. It's sort of like the next generation of more advanced technology being used, more advanced products being developed. We Love to see that because it basically means more product that we can, you know, essentially interest our customers in and our, to, for people to trade. Uh, we offer on our platform the ability for people, both consumers and our pro division uh, for more uh, heavy traders or institutional clients to pledge their assets for staking so we can validate on their behalf. So it's a major component of our growth curve where we see Tezos, which is an example of a staking asset. So so there's there's a lot of interest and there's actually again lack of clarity so you know the irs will say essentially that staking rewards are taxable transactions meaning that the income you receive to the extent that it's over a certain amount is is taxable um so i think that's probably the right answer that's certainly what you would get from the more recent irs frequently answered questions. There's been a lot of debate within the tax community. You're smiling because I know we've had this debate ourselves as to whether that's 
the right answer associated with that, whether it's really from a tax geek concept, it's really more like a stock split or a 305 transaction as opposed because you're taking a built-in component of equity. And in essence, that equity on in the aggregate hasn't really changed. Arguably, it's just been redistributed among the same participants, which typically is not a taxable transaction or a whole host of issues associated with that of how that and there again by provide if it would be really very much in the government's interest to listen to people who then have a, who just have um, a serious knowledge of how this actually works and find and provide the right guidance to the industry so we can operate on the same level playing field but this is the future like these these issues like uh, how the protocols work how the different staking assets will apply this is how smart contracts which the underlying basis of ethan but how this all works essentially is the future of the technology and how uh, customers um, deal with it so we're gonna have to deal with it at some point and you know, I'll make the point that I'm probably going to make later. Ambiguity in the U.S. is not necessarily ambiguity outside the U.S. So there are other jurisdictions that facilitate these types of transactions more readily. And that just essentially means there's more of a, an outflow of capital towards those jurisdictions that have a more, I think, mature view of digital technology and digital assets overall. Staking is a good example of that as well. Yeah. You know, and it's so fascinating because, you know, we, we put staking into its own unique bucket of considerations. And even within that category, I would say there's such variability in what the networks are doing uh, as they allow staking. And, 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 and this gets to help us answer the tax questions. We really got to, is it funny tax people getting into technology, but this is what we do because you have, I, I believe you have to understand what does the act of staking represent to that network? And in some networks, what we see is that action, the staking action actually provides a technological benefit, be it security or consensus or something that helps the, the network operate in exchange for a staking reward that feels service-like. Not all protocols do that, right? Others, and, and you'll talk to the, to the real technology people, not me, I'm just the bean counter here, but the tech people will say, you know, there's actually no technological benefit there. It's just a means for us to distribute out, you know, new new digital assets or, or new rewards. And we, and we sort of work under the guise of staking, but there's not really truly economic benefit there. Then does it feel more like a financial instrument? Kind of, you know, and what does it represent? Fundamentally represents what the tax answer is and the appropriate case law that you would apply, right? We've gone from pro receiving property exchange for a service, maybe, right, to some sort of a financial instrument, two very, very different um, bodies of rules, which I think, you know, the, the, the blogs are helpful sometimes providing context, but maybe not at the level of depth we need. So I would also highlight something that you touched on, which is that not all like there's no uniformity necessarily among all the digital assets we're talking about. So we have products in our exchange that we, we allow people to buy, tra trade, and sell. There are assets outside the U.S. that are broader, uh, more readily available. Uh, they're, they're not all the same. So just there's no, you know, Bitcoin is very different from Tezos and it's yeah. very different from Ether. Like they're just different. So, uh, so we're a, you have to sort of understand how that works to arrive at the right tax conclusion, but it makes it certainly makes our jobs very interesting. It also yeah. highlights what you again started with, which is ambiguity. And we have a lot of ambiguity in this area, lack of clarity, which is going to, it's, you know, it's the enemy of the government at the end of the day. But they should try to understand these issues because again, people will whipsaw the government based on what their interests are. Yeah. I know, Jessica, we won't comment on where staking is in Fidelity uh, Roadmap. I, I, what I'm just thinking about, though, is, and I think Lawrence highlighted something that's really important, is that there is there are so many differences between the various digital assets. And then staking alone is such a complicated thing to understand if you're not that close to digital assets. And so those things need to be understood. And I, But I think that's also what makes it harder to really get clear guidance because there's there's so many differences and there's so many complexities here that really just complicates the whole thing. You have equities, you know, most equities are the same, right? You can put things into buckets much more easily than you can with digital assets. For sure. For sure. And it's always, you know, taking a pause. What is it that we're talking about? What's the thing? As some of us do ask that silly question every once in a while, but it helps you get to the right answer. Um, Jessica, I know this is a truly a global phenomenon that we're experiencing, um, not just digital assets in general, but in particular, you know, investing in financial services. Do you want to talk a little bit about the, the global landscape and, and how you're dealing with a, you know, a global base of, of consumers and funds who are, you know, wanting access to a, you know, a brand like Fidelity? 
Yeah, so um, right, I'll get off the table, right? So FDAS is the business unit I mentioned that we have with um, custody and execution integrated services. And we also have an, a, a UK branch there, or a UK arm um, to, to respond to that. But I think what's important to sort of highlight at the beginning when we think about international is we've been talking about you know, what are the tax issues here, the ambiguity, that sort of thing. But in this case, what's going on has nothing to do with tax by itself. Tax is sort of a response here. And people wanting to work with, with a sort of a local custodian or a local execution services, that's not motivated by tax, well, to my knowledge and what we've seen. That's really motivated by their own concerns, oftentimes regulatory or otherwise. And because it's always easy to me to think this way, if we analogize to more traditional markets, right, you don't typically see people in Europe or Asia opening a bank account in the U.S. or opening an account with a broker dealer in the U.S., right? They want to work with somebody local. And so I think that's what we're seeing in the digital asset space as well is people want to work with somebody local and, and, and they have good reasons for that. What that means for all of us as tax advisors is then we have to think about what are what are the requirements in that local market? What additional issues does this raise? You know, Lawrence already highlighted that some other countries are a little more friendly towards digital assets than perhaps the U.S. might be. And so I think this just raises other interesting questions that we have to work through as we think about what the offerings will be there and as we think about what might be you new know, issues for the customers and for the entity as we think about going into that. And so, Lawrence, I know Coinbase also has a fairly large, quite large presence offshore. And so maybe you want to talk about some of the things that you've seen in that space as well. So we, we actually, I, I appreciate everything you said. I think we sort of see international as the future. Certainly it's an expanded customer base for our exchange. Um, it's also, I think, other jurisdictions that are want to facilitate you know singapore for example has uh, an entire new regime dealing with cryptocurrency which is designed to facilitate transactions on their exchange um so it's a growth model for us just where we operate accessing more customers being able to trade more assets that are not readily tradable in the us we can go into that about the sec and the cftc's perception and just overall views about this i'm sure there's another panel just dealing with those issues there are other countries that are just uh, i think a little bit more um open and open open-minded about some of these issues. So for us, it's an opportunity to, again, mostly accessing the non-US foreign customer base that we have. Um, the rules here are, as uh, as Jessica said, also evolving. So, you know, we, uh, the generally speaking, the most customers in this space particularly would be from Canada, in you know, the major jurisdictions, Canada, the UK, um, um, the EU, and then within the Asia. And so we have to sort of navigate where we establish ourselves, navigate it with Brexit, if we're in London, um, you know, just navigate the KYC AML regime, navigate the OECD rules. So it certainly makes life very interesting, but it really is very much the future associated yeah. with where, where we're going. And, and, and complicated, let's layer on VAT and GST and HST, right? Let's layer on digital services taxes, which are becoming popular. So I think, um, and, and other industries are dealing with this as well, but particularly interesting and challenging when you have um, a, 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 you know varying types of digital assets and protocols and what that represents. So um, all good, all good stuff. Um, Jessica, well, you highlighted an important point, which is like, what are we talking about? Are they financial assets? Are they non-financial okay. assets? Like we could talk about there's one end is stable coins. You could have mainstream old fashioned Bitcoin. You can have staking, you know, old they're just, fashion. did you say old fashioned Bitcoin? I love that. that just yeah. happened. <laughs> right. But it's With true. No offense to Satoshi. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, never. But it's true, right? And we see it of, of, of any little trends we're seeing, to your point, those which are more money like, right? Having certain VAT implications, particular to those that are less money like. That's one trend we could point to. And then there's variants in between. Um, old school Bitcoin. I love it. This is good. I want to save time for um, Jessica. The, the fund structuring and investing is, I believe, is one of the big drivers to the activity that we're seeing today. I know that's a big focus area of yours. Can you talk a little bit about some of the considerations there and some of the drivers, maybe some of the structuring that you're, you're seeing? Yeah, so I'll, I'll preface this by saying, for me, this is, is a largely academic conversation that I find really interesting as we see things developing. Fidelity obviously has a huge asset management business, and so I'm just always interested in these things. Um, but so I think what we're seeing is that as digital assets become more mainstream, there's been a huge growth in fund options. I think this is probably in part motivated by 
people want access. You know, Rob mentioned some really good studies at the beginning. People want access. They want these assets in their portfolios, but they might be hesitant to invest directly for whatever reason, or they simply can't. There might be regulatory reasons or other guidelines that don't allow them. So like pension plans and the like might not be able to directly invest in digital assets. Mm -hmm. And so they're looking for fund structures that might be available to them so that they can get that access, right? And I think what we also saw is that there's also mass market appeal, right? Where there are a number of folks who tried to file for ETFs over the last few years. So that something could be publicly listed and publicly traded. And none of those were successful. Those were, it's largely an SEC issue there that's beyond the bounds of this conversation, but those filings happened. And I think what's really interesting is what's been raised by some of those filings. And so the big question here for tax purposes is what we call the PTP question, the publicly traded partnership question. So the general rule there is that if you are a publicly traded partnership, meaning you're either listed on exchange, like an ETF would be, or effectively you're just really highly liquid. If you're one of those two, then the default is that you would be taxed as a corporation. So that would mean there's a corporate layer of tax, you pay out dividends, very different than a partnership itself, which would have flow through of income, which is what people are often looking for here. And the exception to that, there's a variety, but the exception for that that a lot of people have been looking at is a qualifying income exception, whereby you need 90% or more of the fund's income to be of a certain type. And this can include commodity income, especially if it's a principal activity of the fund. And so now I think it's sort of obvious to everyone what the question here is, is are these digital assets commodities. The IRS obviously has not spoken to that. You know, the CFTC has an opinion on some of these assets. Does that really have any bearing for the IRS? And it was really interesting to me, for instance, reading through these ETF filings, the positions that they were taking on that, because this is sort of fundamental to how your product is structured and to what you're offering. You're promising people an interest in a partnership, and there might be risk there that it's actually not going to be respected as a partnership for tax purposes. So I think there's a lot of interest in creating more fund structures, in doing public fund structures, and there's been some that have been incredibly successful in the secondary market in particular, but these questions need to be answered if there's really going to be a robust, true fund market here that's available to people because customers and, 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 and uh, partners really need certainty in what they're investing in. They want to know that the tax treatment they're signing up for is the tax treatment they're going to have at the end of the day. And this is a pretty fundamental question that hasn't been answered. And I don't know if it's a question that folks are really focused on as they think about this. I know advisors are certainly advising in different ways on this and people are willing, as we've talked about in other places, to take on different levels of risk here. Um, but it's not, I'm not, I do not know if the government is thinking about this or not, because I think in a lot of ways, there's some bigger questions that need to be answered first. But I, I find it really fascinating, really interesting. And I think it's one that really needs to be addressed if we're going to have really a robust market here for these sorts of things. No, it's a, it's I think the point. government has actually answered that. Unfortunately, I think the government has said whether we like it or not. And I, it's, it's again, a, it's a frozen concept because I don't think it addresses the evolution of what digital currency or digital assets are. But they basically said it's just undifferentiated property. They have not said it's a security and they have not said it's a commodity. We can have a long, robust debate about that. But I think, again, whether that's right or wrong, I think the government has spoken. So, and what's the gist, though, right? I mean, we got to say, what's the, what are we talking about? Because, I mean, we're seeing investments, you know, many are going long in Bitcoin. They're, they're taking on different altcoins. They're taking on staking assets. And then, you know, you're even bringing in the real live income streams, if you're going to call staking income, in a fund. We're not used to that behavior, right? We're used to, you know, capital gains and sometimes losses. Um, but fascinating, right, how this all relates together. Um, we are almost out of time. The one question I have is where are things going? Like, what are you guys super excited about that's that, that's coming at us? What's coming next in the industry? I know tax people getting excited about the industry, right? But what is it that, that you're excited about? Jessica, we'll, we'll start with you. So I don't have anything particular I'll say that I'm excited about, but I'll give the cheesy tax lawyer answer, which basically is there's something new each day as we're talking about this. You know, we just highlighted a whole bunch of issues that are really interesting for tax lawyers. I mean, Rob, I think you said at the beginning, this is really fun for us because we get to do a lot of thinking about new issues and shades of gray. And so that's really what I'm excited about as we move forward here. Yeah, it's def definitely better than answering the same question time after time, right? <laughs> it's great, this is good. Lawrence, what about you? What are you excited about in the future? 
I think probably the most exciting area is particularly with COVID is stable coins. It's just like how digital assets and the digital technology can be used to facilitate through a fairly easy mechanism called the internet, um, the exchange of value. And so stable coins are an example of that. It's a digital representation of value. Um, it can be backed up by currency. There are even variations of that. But I think that's to me the more that's one of the more exciting areas. Like how do and in addition to that, it it facilitates exchanges of values in a much easier framework than traditional banking framework. It allows the unbanked, therefore, to potentially access value and to be able to exchange value more with greater ease across political boundaries, across geographies. It's just a much that's the promise of digital assets. And yeah. stablecoins isn't a good, you know, it's a it's a variant of that, but I think a, probably one of the more exciting areas that we focus on as well at, at Coinbase. I love that you brought up the unbanked piece and that came up um, is even in the recent Senate hearings around um, CBDC, central bank digital currencies, um, and because we've gone from, you know, cryptocurrencies to then stable coins of different varieties to now a really important topic of central bank digital currencies and how this could actually have an impact on segments of societies, not just here in the U.S., but abroad, in bringing access to capital and transactions and commercial activities to those who previously didn't have it. So really interesting social issues and what a great time um, to address it, which I am incredibly passionate about. I'm also, uh, I, I just think it's fascinating that we can have something like a programmable fund, you know, that they, a, a, some sort of digital currency, digital asset, which, you know, is not just a means of exchange, but interacts with things like smart contracts and, and can, you know, facilitate, um, you know, very complex contracting mechanisms in small doses and microtransactions and, and affect the, the remuneration to the right parties based on what they agreed to and, and managing IP in, in small doses. I just think that's fascinating and unlocks tremendous potential in new commercial activities, but also solves a lot of what we've been struggling with in the past in terms of IP protection. So I, I, I'm, I'm totally cheesed out on the whole pro programmable fund thing and made possible by you guys and the great organizations that you're with. So um, what a pleasure to spend time with you and really appreciate everything you're doing. And um, I know it's a the compliance burden, the regulatory environment. It's not easy, right? This is not for the weak at heart, but um, but we show up every day and, and keep smiling and keep trudging ahead doing the right thing. It keeps the blood flowing. It does, <laughs> it does indeed. Thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. And uh, I'm you're sure welcome. we talk. Thank you. Thanks Thank so you. much. Thank you, Jessica. Take care. Thanks All the best. So. Bye, guys. Thank you.